what the jail is for. And I'll tell you what, I've been, in fact, I've been serving the last week. I've been preaching the jails since 1986. Amen. Amen. The jails today, they're far greater than I've ever, I could ever think or better. These guys, I'll tell you what, and what all I did was in our country, you got to take over. And I got, I'm not real good at getting things up, you know, on the screen or playing music when you got all the deals you got here. I had it all figured out a heck work. But I found out that had to wait till everybody got in there. I had to wait till I got in there and re reprogram the thing. <laughs> but here, here, you know what I did? I said, is there any inmate here how to work this thing? One guy got up and he said, I'm you got to go. Yeah. You, you start to understand we got to let God be God no matter what. Yes, sir. Right. Right. Just, I think some of us are afraid to let God be God because of situations like that. Yeah. Anyway, so we're going on and on and on. And you know, I just looked at that at me again. What? After we preached, it was. Why don't you come here and give a little testimony? Hey, God, get up and give a testimony. <coughs> about how bad things were in his life. He was, he was, he was raised good. Things were going pretty good, but the bottom seemed to fall his life. He got caught up in drugs, lost all his relatives, everybody died and everything else. And here now he's in prison. But still he said, he says, God put a passion in my heart like never before. Amen. To let him have his way. And just the fact that we call him up here, up there, and let him testify about what he was all about. So this is what I've been praying for. This, this really assures me what God has called me to do. Amen. And then uh, I said, huh? then next thing you know, you know, we're giving a little photo thing. And I mentioned just about every one of those inmates down there. I said, it's listening to God. I said, well, you do what God wants you to do. And they said, yes, we got a chance to pray with them. I don't know about that, not raise their hand or anything. But you know, God's going to make, make that. Make a mighty, mighty work in the people. Or do a mighty, mighty work and the people are going to submit to Him. It's just submitting to him. And watch him. When the bottom seems to be falling out, it's not. Right, right. That's getting you out of the way. <laughs> I'm not talking about. Yeah. Yeah. No, Since I was sent to hell, it's rebellion against God that it hit me. It's not by mind or by fire, it's by his spirit. It's a matter of giving ourselves to him. And then you're not going to want to do these other crazy things. You have to be back. The Bible says you have a little line for something. Say, Come on, we're not talking about pivoting around. We're going to serve God or not. The Bible says the gospel build his kingdom. That's right. Then I did something. You know what I did? I said, you know what? Then I it back. I said, I'll tell you what. God's put my heart to disciple people. You guys, when you get out of jail, you want to come. We're going to house you, and we're going to disciple you. Amen. Amen. Don't ask me where we get out of all the buildings and all we need. I'm telling you what, I believe that. Amen. Here's the deal. God will put a fire in bones. That's what God kept me going for all these years. It's that fire. Through it all, you know, Lord God, you can make a way. Yeah. And by the way, the music we played, it was so annoying. Yeah. Uh, you cannot believe it. I mean, it's, it's about nine minutes and nothing but annoying music. Like at the start, and at the very end, we had another song called Amazing Grace. Tremendously annoying. Yeah. These guys are here. How many of you have been in jail or prison? I mean, there's a bunch of whips in there. <coughs> Come on, you know what I'm talking about? These guys, man, you can see tears in their eyes, they can see the passion. You can see, you know what it's so exciting to me when you see people's eyes light up. Yeah. The only way that can happen is through God. <coughs> Now, didn't he say he'd go build this church? Didn't he choose us to bring more fruit? How many of us can say, you know what? I got to put a pillow. I can't say that. I'm going to put playing around. How many of us can say, I'm going to put playing around and get down to business and let God be God? He didn't let it be God's idea. He didn't let it be God's plan. He didn't let it be God's idea. He didn't let it be God's plan. He didn't let it be God's idea. 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 He didn't let it be God's but hell bent to hell. Amen. Uh, come on, let's give the Lord a good praise. Of God.
about the room here. Uh, we, we were praying for, Pastor Remington, I believe, is in the other room right now. But we are praying for his daughter, Kara, and she's here today. So so let's give the Lord a praise wow. offering because we're going to the hospital. Uh, she was very sick with a uh, like throat infection or something going on. But man, she was uh, she was able to come home here today. So praise God. So that means we're going to continue praying, okay? Let's continue to pray for people. Um, I do have a list here, but um, I have some other announcements that we're going to go through. But first, let's talk about prayer. First thing I want to tell you, look, if you need prayer, Pastor David Torres back there has prayer cards. Go ahead and fill one out. Put it in the offering basket. If it's prayer for yourself, for someone else, uh, for a situation, put it in the offering basket. And what we do here at Church on the Street is we have a prayer list. Okay, and what we do is we hand it out to people who can pray at home. If you have five minutes, ten minutes, and you can take the extended prayer list that we have here, and you can intercede for these people, uh, please take one home. But what I'm going to ask you to do right now is if you have five minutes, ten minutes, during the week, and you can intercede for these people, please raise your hand. My wife is going to go around, and she's going to give you one of these extended prayer lists that you can uh used to intercede for these people. So my wife can go around right now. And what I'm going to do is we have our weekly uh, prayer list up here. Uh, and we usually lift up the people that are dealing with this cancer. We always pray for these people up here that are dealing with cancer, okay? And we also want to pray for our ministry. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to go ahead and go into prayer for these weekly uh, weekly needs, uh, for the healing and for the, for the cancer situation, and for our ministry needs. And I want you to agree with me, okay? Please just agree with me in the end uh, with a loud amen, and then I'm going to pray for some of your needs also. Okay? Uh, good, good, good. We got one more right here. Thank you, guys. Thank you for taking those uh, extended prayer lists off. The list is getting longer and longer, which is good. We love that. Amen? amen. Thank you. It used to be just, what, just a half a page in the front. Now you got to turn it around, so make sure you guys turn it around. Okay? Amen. You're not done if you finish the front. Turn it around. There's more in the back. Praise God. All right. Let's get ready to go into prayer, okay? <clears throat> okay, Father God, I just want to praise you and thank you, Lord God, for your goodness and your praise. And I know the miracles you can do with this cancer, Lord God. So, Father, we lift up these people, Father, and we pray for miracles in their lives. We pray for healing, we pray for comfort, we pray for peace. For Sherry Hansen, Debbie Mitchell, Dolores Grisby, Beverly Aronson, Eric Ingenhall, Dad, Mike Burnage, Brad, Dr. Ripstein, and Sandy, uh, Mary Rose, friends. We just lift them up, Father God, and we know that cancer is nothing to you, Father God. So we just we just ask you, Father, bring them peace and comfort. <coughs> Father, we lift up the ministry needs to you, Father God. Through all these jails and prisons around the state, Father God, we just pray for strong disciples and revival in the hearts of these men and women in all the jails and prisons in the country, Lord God. And we continue to pray for the people at the soup kitchen for revival of their souls and for the love of Christ to be demonstrated in these facilities, Lord God. The church, the church on the street alumni, we continue to pray for the revival in their hearts, Lord God, and regularly giving to church on the street. We also pray for deliverance and salvation, Lord God. We lift up these people. We lift up Miss Barb's son, Justin, and the grandchildren, Ashley and Preston. Dallas and mom and stepdad, Renee Gomez and Tina and everybody and all the other people, Father God, that are dealing with this with this addiction. <coughs> we just lift them up in salvation to you, Lord God. We pray for Church on the Street for a new location for our outreaches, for souls, disciples, but above all, above, above all your spirit, Lord, in the name of Jesus. And we pray for the men's mission, for the well-being of our guests, and for the needs to be met for that facility. In the name of Jesus, we pray for Pastor Jesse in Nicaragua, Dr. Faisal in India. Robin in India, and Pastor Ramon and Miss Teresa and Nogales and all the men, women, and children under the earth. All these things. In the name of Jesus, and everybody say, Amen. Is there anybody in you who has a need? Praise God. We are a needy people. Amen. Ever since the beginning of the time, we've been a needy people. So I want to pray for your needs also. Okay. Um, and like I said, make sure you fill those cards out if you have a tender privilege. If you have uh, unspoken needs, also put them on there. You can put on spoken. We won't put any needs up in the prayer list, but just fill those out. Father God, I raise up every person in here that walked in here with a need today, Lord God. Those that came in here with a worry, with an anxiety, Father God, whether it be their health, their finances, Father God. Father, I just lift them up. And I just want to pray, Father, that they go home knowing that you know about their needs. That you've got it all working together for their lives. 
Father God, as we submit to you, as we call out to you, we know that there's only love coming from you. So, Lord God, I just pray that every single person in here tonight thinks about how good and loving you've been to us, Lord God. And we know that you've been all working together for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's give the Lord a good praise. Awesome. General Moody and his family. Okay, so let me pray for him too. Father God, I want to pray in the name of Jesus for General and his family and all the needs for his for his mighty, mighty discipleship, for his mighty, mighty calling, Lord God. That the Lord continue to bless him and give him good help for him. And give him leaders and give him everything he needs, Father God. Because what's in his heart is good, and we know this, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, I pray for Redeemed International and all the disciples there and all the pastors and the leaders, Lord God, for their church services. I just pray for everything they do, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, I pray and everybody say, Amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. All right. So I got some announcements. Um, let's start off with, uh, so yesterday we had an awesome picnic, okay? If you missed it, you missed out. We had an awesome time. First thing I want to do is I just want to say thank you to every single person that was at the picnic that volunteered to help. You guys know who you are, okay? You're, a lot of you guys are here today. Okay, thank you so much for all the help you provided. Okay, and I don't wanna mention names because if I, there's a lot, and if I mention, if I don't mention somebody, they might be a little sad, right? But it happens. But I do wanna mention one name, however, okay? Joe, how many hot dogs were cooked yesterday? About 300, 200? David? David? About 200? Yeah, okay. about there. Yeah. I say about, it was over 200 easy. Over 200 hot dogs, over 150, about 150 burgers, right? In 95 degree, degree weather. And when I asked if he wanted to get relieved, he said no. Okay, I didn't want to say thank you, Pastor David Torres. For yeah. But he stood, there, he stood there and cooked all the food for us. And man, you know, I see people eating burgers and I see smiles when people eat burgers. So thank you. That's thank you so much. Way. And thank you, Joe, for setting up uh, for actually during the week, we, we usually get our chairs and tables donated by a, by a good friend of Church on the Street. But they had an emergency and they couldn't do it. So God bless them. We'll keep them in prayer. But Joe did find uh, some chairs and tables. And I was freaking out during the week that we were going to get them. And he, you know, he got a bunch of other stuff ready that we all we use at the picnic. So thank you, Joe, also. Man. Like I said, thank you to all of you. We will be having another one probably in October when it gets a little cooler. Yeah, we don't want uh, Pastor David Torres yeah, I'm ready to go. to be weather, right? Right? In July, you want to do one in July? Yeah. <laughs> Out there? Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, I do have a birthday today. Um, Dan, are you here? He's on the other side. But you know what? Dan has been instrumental in the church on the street. They set up the Mighty Men of Valor. Okay, and he's here today with his family. He's been really busy. Um, you know, he's switching jobs. So I just want to say happy birthday if you're on the other side uh, and you can hear us. We're going to sing happy birthday. Ready? One, two, three. Happy birthday. Anything's possible. Okay? As long as you're breathing, 
anything's possible. Forget about all that in the back, behind the chains or whatever it is, and look forward. Okay? Let's look forward, right? And see what God can do in your life. So I want to say to those guys at the mission, because I believe one of them's here and the other one's not here. You know, as long as you're breathing, anything's possible. Amen. When you're not breathing anymore, then that's all up to God. Amen. And here, look, listen. You have a future. And as long as you're breathing. All right? God bless you guys. Okay. So now, um, we are going to have our, are we having our women in faith uh, the first week of the month? Want to here and talk about that? Since we got all these beautiful people here, praise the Lord. All right. So my dear wife is going to talk about the women in faith meeting. All right. So the first Monday of every month, we do have our women in faith meeting, and it is for ladies only. Sorry, guys. But it is coming up. I know. Sorry. Um, it's going to be, um, oh, it is May 4th at 6 p.m. Yeah. May 4th at 6 p.m. And um, you guys are more than welcome. You ladies are more than welcome to come. And if you guys know of any ladies that can come, May six. It is May six. Yeah, that's why I was like, wait, it's May six. May six at six p.m. is Monday at six p.m. here. Okay, it'll be right here in the chapel. So if you guys can come, if you can't make it by six, just show up anyway. We're gonna have food, games, fun, prizes, all that fun stuff. Lots of. Like fun stuff, I don't know. We chat, we have a good time, it's awesome. So I can't wait to see you guys there. And I think someone else has a birthday coming up. Two days. I think Pastor JC has a birthday coming up.
Friday, we have the church picnic on Saturday. Today, I gotta disseminate everything that we've got going because this week, stuff has to go out. We had the end day end, the people who sponsored the NAACP last week give us hygiene and bags. So this week's about disseminating all that. And that's, that's you know, that's all the Lord, but this, you guys, I'm going to go for line. This is where it lies at, you know. If I can show you I love you by helping you, I will. If I can show you my, that I love you by saying, well, maybe now is not the time, or you went through the program, you might have to wait a little while. To, I'm also trying to, to work with you. And I have one particular person in here to help blame for what the resources are for Church on the Street. Love doing it, love being down in some kitchen, love putting it together, love figuring it out. You know what I'm saying? Um, I'm the one who goes down to cast and is like, I'm homeless, can I get some dental? And they're like, no, you don't live here. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just that person, honorary and, you know what I'm saying, cantankerous. However, you guys, Pat Bianco's the grandfather of Milestones. Yeah, right. I know that we've done a lot through the homeless court and EMV and everything, but Pat's here now, and he is the grandfather of Milestones. He's the
that we're able to be. You know, we should celebrate that, right? And one of the ways that we celebrate this is by doing our, our offerings and our time. So I just want to just join me today in this celebration. Amen? Father God, I praise you and I thank you and I ask you, Lord God, to just continue to bless church on the street. Father God, bless those people that are giving online right now. Bless those people that are giving here today in church, Lord God. And also bless the person that can't give, Lord God. We ask you in the name of Jesus to just help them with their finances and guide them, Lord God. And show us what to do, Lord God. We need your help. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
right? But, you know, somebody came to me and said, you know, Pastor, I'm sorry, uh, Bishop Papia, he's a man, he's a doer. He's a man. He's a man. So I just, listen, give me a Bishop Papia, and warm one. our adultery, our fornication, our murder, our theft, 
everything, Jesus. You, you took it all for us, Lord God, and we just thank you today, Lord, that, that you came in and you saved the ungodly right in the midst of our ungodliness. Yes, and I thank you today, God, that you would be glorified in this place, that we would preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nothing less, nothing more, Lord. And we just thank you for your power. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the men of God that have gone before us, Lord God, and have taught our generation, this young generation. Thank you for Pastor Walt. Thank you, Lord God, for this ministry. Thank you for Pastor Barnett. Thank you for these men of faith, God, that have gone before us and show us how to finish the race, how to finish strong in Jesus' name. And all God's kids said, Amen. Amen. Let's praise Jesus one more time. Amen. Amen. So I was I was struggling on which which direction to go, and I was praying, and you know it's always you just never know where the Holy Spirit's going to land you. And <clears throat> we're going to go to the Potter's house in a few minutes in Jeremiah 18. But before we do, we need to set a precedent. And we need to understand what the potter is going to use to make a vessel of honor. And where he finds it. And so when we go to we go to the scriptures, we find out a place called Murderer's Meadow. And in the Greek, it's, it's called Akadon, or the field of blood. Again, it's, it's a place called Murderer's Meadow. Where there's murderers, there's thieves, there's fornicators. It was a field where they were to incinerate the corpses of criminals. That if you were a criminal or you were caught in an act of any sort of adultery or any kind of fornication or anything like that, the law would condemn you. And the Jews would be able to, you know, stand behind the law and they would execute people that were caught up in things. And it was, it was specific for the Gentiles. And they would put the Gentile ashes and they would, they would put the Gentile bones and any unclean animal would be buried inside of this field of blood. And it was called, it literally in the Greek means murderer's meadow. And I don't know about you, but God saved me in the midst of my perversion. I didn't choose him. He came down and he breathed life in a corpse like me. I was laying dead. I didn't have any ability to respond to him. He came to me and he, put, he pulled his hand out and he touched me and breathed life into me. Yes. And pulled me up right out of the midst of what I was, what, who I was. I didn't even understand it and God gave me life. And Pastor Barnett preached a sermon on Wednesday night on February 3rd, 1993. All those years ago. And, and in the midst of that, God used this ministry to save a piece of junk like me. A wretch like me. Someone who's full of pain. Someone who's full of adultery. Someone's on his best day. God, Jesus said that it is in my heart. Is adultery, fornication, guilt, murder, theory, all these things. He didn't come to save the righteous. He came to save wretches like us. Like us. Let's find out. Let's read it. In, in Matthew chapter 27. Let's go to the, the murderer's meadow. And we can see that, that God used. He, he, he pre-planned this whole thing out. To save you and me. No one, no one murdered Jesus. No one took his life. Jesus gave his life. Jesus volunteered his life. From eternity he came. He knew that he was going to give his life on that cross for us as we celebrate that coming into this week. And we understand that. In the, in the third verse, in Matthew chapter 27, we see Judas hangs himself. It says that Judas' betrayer, seeing that he had, made, he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver uh, to the chief priests and the elders. And if you ever have a Judas in your midst, they always come and bring the money, the blood money, and they don't repent to Jesus. They don't repent to God. But they repent to man. And Judas repented to man, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, well, what is that to us? You see to it. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. 
But the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, It is not lawful to put them into the treasury because they are the price of blood. And they consulted together and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. And really when you break down that word stranger, it's, it's something a little bit more, uh, it, it, it more it's more of a, a, perverse, a perversion that, to bury perverts in. Therefore, that field has been called the field of blood of the state, or al -Kadama. Then it was filled, it was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, And they took thirty pieces of silver, the value of him who is Christ, whom they of the children of Israel prized, and gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord had directed me. I want to speak to you tonight about, uh, you know, when we would go to high school, we, you know, I don't know about you, but I got a lot of F's in high school. I didn't get a lot of A's. I wasn't the sharpest pencil in the box. But I want to talk about some F's that Jesus came and did. You know what? He's the finder. He's the former. And he is the framer. And he is the forger. And he is the finisher of our faith. He came in and he found us right in the middle of what we were in. And this is what the this is what G, this is what God's word says that is the clay. That this is what it is. He's, he says, this is the thing that is inside. It's full of broken pieces. Marred shards. Marred up shards and broken pieces. I got in this bag here a bunch of broken pieces this evening. And so the potter would, would fix it, he would make his, his pottery, and then he would mess something up, and then it would be thrown out into this field of blood or, or murderer's meadow. And so the, you have all these broken pieces inside of this, in the side of this bag, which is a, a broken pot. But anyone who was, who was messed up and left for dead, someone in, the, in Adam, in the first Adam, that you were marred, that you were a part of that first Adam, that, that sin that happened in the garden, that, uh, that sin that you, you had no control of, but because you were you're, who you are, there was, a, there was an imputation from that fall from Adam, and you and I have what's called this, this corruption, this pollution that is inside our nature. Yeah. And we were born into iniquity, we were born into perversion from our mother's womb. And we didn't have an ability to self-right ourselves or right the ship or do anything to please God. And God had to find us in the middle of it all. Oh. But these, these parts, these little, these little part shirts, man. This little thing here, this thing's got some edges on it. That thing here can cut. And that thing was broken. It was a broken piece of part shard. That's where these broken pieces would end up. That you and I have got testimonies in this room. We got testimonies of being molested. We got testimonies of being raped. We've raped others and people have raped us. Things have happened to us and we've done things to others that we're not proud of. Right. But see, you've got to understand that God came in and he's, this is the, the material that God uses are these broken pieces, are these broken shards, sir. This is what he did. He came in and he, and he, he found this field of blood. And this is, this is what the redemption price paid for was this piece of blood. Filled with all these broken pieces, man. You're a broken piece, another broken piece. And it's just like God has used this, the cross, to pay the price to redeem us out of the murderer's meadow. That's what we did. We were just murdering. We, we, we were causing blood. He found us in the middle of our blood. We were aborted fetuses. In the Greek it says, we were aborted fetuses, left for twice dead over. Yes. And God had to come in and go to the cross for us. And he did that exactly. As we just do the introduction here this, this evening. And, and I'm just I'm, I'm, I'm thankful today to be a part in this room. I'm thankful for Pastor Randy. And I'm, I, I've been listening to some of the, the sermons the lead in. And Pastor Walt, I'm just, I'm just thankful for this ministry, and I'm honored and I'm humbled to be behind this pulpit Amen. this this evening. And my spiritual father, I'm thankful that that he that that he's put up with this idiot all these years, and he's and, and just and God just just continues to to be long suffering towards me as as I'm continuing to walk this thing through and walk it out. But I want to talk about discipleship. Because when you look at the house, the potter's house, yeah. we see a person. Because listen, 
You'll never submit to the principle or the purpose in the house of God until you see the person. Jesus. You and I can see and hear Jesus. There's a lot of churches, there's a lot of bodies, they'll preach principles and ethics and morality and, and legalism and all these different things, but they can't show you the one who went to the cross for us. They can't show you Jesus. They can't show you the nail-scarred hands and on his hands was your name. Yes. Thank God for that. Yes. That we would see Jesus tonight. That we would see the person before we submit to the principle. Yes. So let's go to Jeremiah chapter 18 as we kind of lay the groundwork a little bit about, about what it is the material that, that God uses. And it's a very familiar story but it's something that, you know, this is a perennial message and perennials uh, come out once a year. It's important to remind ourselves uh, who is in control and what God is doing and letting God be God and, and, and allowing Him to, to speak to our hearts today. But God uses these unbendable, stubborn, broken uh, hearted just individuals to reveal the potter. He uses Isaiah, who in the year that King Uzziah died, he, he saw the Lord high and lifted up. He uses uh, Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, and he uses Zechariah, that, that someone who saw further than any other Old Testament prophet. He saw the apocalypse that's yet to come to pass. He uses Matthew, the tax collector, in the New Testament to write and pen what we just read. Right. And so we have to go to some of these scriptures here and understand what it is that God is wanting us to understand about Christianity about what it's all involved. But he says here in verse number one in Jeremiah 18, if you're there, say faith. faith. In Jesus' name, he said, the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, arise and go down to the potter's house. Amen. He doesn't say, you know, intellectually ascend into something that he's going to reveal to you. He brings our lives to a place where we're down. Yes. Where we're at a place where I all I, I all I can do is is listen is hear his voice. We're down, we're down. Come come down to the potter's house. We're not coming into the potter's house and into the house of God to, you know, to intellectually ascend and just trying to get more knowledge and gain more understanding. The only way you're going to get more, to grow, grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord is God through the Spirit is, brings us down to a level so that we can understand that we've got to submit to about what we're ready to hear. Yes. He says, arise and go down. It's kind of like a go up and go down. Brings us down. Yeah. He says, to the potter's house. And, and there I will cause you to hear my words. Amen. When you come to the potter's house, there's... There's a principle that we understand that, that God is the boss. That's the principle that we learn. Let God be God. If you just get out of the way and, and just, you know, just, just, there was a song way back in the day in the 70s that came out by Love Song, which, you know, they made a, a song they, they used to call, uh, call a backseat Christian. That, that there was no, no you, you know, the, if you're a front seat Christian and you're trying to steer the car, it's not too long before you just realize that, Lord, I've been steering my car too long. Right. And I need to get out of this whip, get out of your way and let God be God. And get in the back seat and let God take over the front seat and let Him drive and let Him take over your life. And let, let's just see what God does here with that. But He helps us to understand that, that in this potter, the word for potter there means to form or to fashion or to frame. And he is the former. He's the one that came in and found us in the middle of that field of blood. But it says that I went down to the potter's house and there he was making something at the wheel. He was going to work. And you know that God goes to work with knowledge. And in this house, we learn that if we go to the church and we, he found us in the midst of our field of blood in our murderer's meadow and he saves us, comes in and justifies the ungodly 
And he brings us into a house, and this is where we hear the message. We hear the word of truth. We hear the word of God. And we hear what God wants to do. And, and you have to understand that as he's given me this creative picture, and, and, and the Apostle Paul, he was a, he was a creative theo theologian, and he, he uh, uses all these analogies in the word of God. Uh, Jesus himself, a carpenter that whittled wood and made, and made things out of it. And then we see the, a husband to a bride. We see a potter to the clay. We, we understand the head to the body. We see a cornerstone to a building. We have all these analogies and because you and I need to see these things so that we can understand and apply them because God uses the simplest revelations or the simplest things in Scripture generally to speak to us the deepest truths. And this is definitely one of them. So he says in the vessel that he made of clay was marred. And that, that word for marred there means corrupted. It means decayed. It means spoiled, polluted, perverted, bent, distorted. It means ruined. That it was ruined. That something came in and, and ruined you and ruined me. That there's things that took place in our life that were in our past that came in and stole our innocence. And see, the devil comes in and tries to lie to us. And you and I, if we come in and we, we, we agree with that lie, we give it authority in our life. But when we come in and hear God's perspective and God's word in, in, a, in a house, in, in God's place, like, like the potter's house, like church on the street, we're hearing God's perspective. Yeah. We're hearing the word of God. Amen. And, and, and then now you start to understand, well, wait a minute, I don't have to agree with the devil anymore from what, that's not my identity. Right. That, that God came in and he saved me and pulled me up out of that field of blood. And now uh, he's got a plan. He's got a purpose. And his purpose is in his heart. Just look at it for a second. You have a potter. And he's fashioning you on the wheel. And, and this is what he says here is that he's making something on the wheel. He's the creator. He's the former. He's the one that comes in and he's forming something on the wheel. And when you walk into that house and you see his face and you understand the intensity, he's got fire in his eyes as he's fashioning and forming your life. You're sitting in that chair this evening, but I'm telling you right now that there is a velocity happening in your life. There's a vocation that God has set you in in your life. And He is in control of the velocity of that circumstance. Whatever that thing is that God is using to spin that thing, and you're on that wheel, and He's got you in a vocation. Whatever that is, whatever your ministry is, whatever your marriage is, whatever your calling is, it's God who is in control. He's in control of it all. Yes. yes. Amen. And it's one thing that you have to understand in the, that when you walk into that room, you realize that His hand is always on the clay. His hand is never off the clay, Pastor. It's, it's just, he's, he's, he's uh, turning that wheel. He's in charge of the velocity. Sometimes it seems like things are happening really fast in the spirit. And sometimes things slow down a little bit. Like, where are you at, God? It's okay, I'm here. And, and, and my hand will never lift off of that clay. You know? And let me tell you something here. Once in a while, we're tempted to jump off that table. <laughs> There's something called inside of your arm. It's a, it's a median nerve. And that median nerve runs right from your right in the middle of your of your wrist and all the way up your arm. Yes, sir. <laughs> no matter how big you are, if you know where to touch that median nerve, I mean you can turn, you can just apply a little bit of pressure on that thing and you can control someone, you can have them go wherever you want them to go. Yeah. Once in a while, God has to get a hold of our median nerve. Yes. And bring us where he wants us to take us. And he knows. Because see, listen. If God is God. And he is doing what he wants to do. Don't you think. That he is going to work in your life with knowledge. He's got knowledge. He's got knowledge of what he's going to do. With your life. 
He, and in his hand, you feel the heartbeat of his will for your life inside of his hand as it's touching your life and as it's forming you. See, our life before Christ was formless. It was shapeless. It had no meaning. There was nothing. The only thing, oh, you know, go, go fill the vacuum with, with women and with sex and with drugs and with men and with money and, and all this stuff and lust for more things. And it didn't fill the vacuum. Right. Never does and it never will. Right. And so here comes God. He comes in and now he's got this heart and he's got this mind for you. And when you understand the person behind the wheel yes. went to the cross for you. He gave up a heavenly realm. He's a king. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And God gives you the thing that you needed the most, and that's the gift of faith. Yes. Yes. The gift of faith. Yes. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And he gives you. That's, that's the definition of grace is he's given you the gift of faith. He gave it to us. There was nothing that we did to come out of that field of blood. But he goes to work with knowledge. And he's making something on the wheel tonight. Whether you feel it or not, some of us feel it. Some of us got a feeling that sometimes we need a good correction. We need a good crack. We need a good instruction. But know the one that's behind giving us that discipline and loving us. Is God Himself. He has an intention. He has a heart for us. Yeah. But we were shapeless. We were formless. We were unfruitful. Then he says here, he said that he would, that the this was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again into another vessel as it seemed good to who? To the potter, to me. And this room is full of men and women that that we were found, and, and, and doesn't, doesn't church on the street, don't, don't they, don't we go out? Don't you go out into the field of blood? Yeah. Don't you go out into murderer's meadow? Yeah. Don't you step out into this field of blood, Akadama? Aren't you, go, aren't you obeying the call? And God tells you to go find some more broken pieces. Go find some broken shards. They're not hard to identify. They're all over. They're everywhere. That's what God wants us to go do. That helps. They don't do it. You get a reason for your life. Get purpose and get a sense of reason for your life and get it back. And you go out and you come out and you start going into the field of blood and you start seeing and you start pulling people out yes. that, that are spiritually dead. Yes. But God is using you as the hand of the potter on the wheel. He's using men. He's using the domata, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher. That's who you are. He's made you. You were a broken piece, Christian. You're a broken piece, Norman, pastor. And God now has pulled you up out of the field. And now look at you, man. You're an evangelist. You're a worship leader. Are you kidding me? Just, just 10 years ago, we were looking for butts in the gutter. We were looking for butts. We were looking for just, you know, Twinkie bars or whatever. When we could get some food or we were cracked out of our heads, messed out of our minds, drunk out of our, you know. Yeah, no wonder you were drunk and no wonder you were missed. I'd be on drugs too. I'd be, you know, sold out to alcoholism too. If I had that, whatever it is that we dealt with in our past, I just wanted it to go away. I didn't want to think about it anymore. I wanted to inoculate myself. But then God comes in and gives you the Holy Ghost. You give the Word of God. And it shows you that I've got a reason. I've got a purpose. And I've got a plan. Yeah. Hold on. Jesus. Yes, He's in control Amen. this evening. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. He says that the Word of the Lord came to me saying, O house, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter? Says the Lord, look as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. At the instant I speak concerning a nation, and concerning a kingdom, I pluck up, I pull down, and I destroy. If that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring on it. Wait a minute. Mean God, you, you're fashioning something 
to, to get our attention. It's, it's, can, it's, a, can you, it's a can you hear me now moment. When things happen against us in our life that get our attention, it's like, can you hear me now, son? I'm trying to talk to you about that. When things are happening against the country, the, this country, like, hey, can you hear me now, America? Can you hear me now? Can you understand that you need to return to your first love? That I still have an intention, I still have a design for your life. But he says here, that, and the instant I speak concerning the nation and concerning the kingdom, to build and to plant it, if it does evil in my sight, so that it does not obey my voice, then I'm relent concerning the good with which I said I would benefit it. Now therefore speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I am fashioning a disaster and devising a plan against you. Return now, everyone from his evil way, and make your ways and your doings good. And here it is, it's like, okay, yes, Lord. I I don't want I don't I, I want to stay in your I want to stay in your goodwill. I want to obey you. You filled me with your spirit, and now I want to go the direction that you want me to go. And we know the story of Jeremiah. That this was a nation that whom you know left God and, and went to idols and did things, but they were still his kids. And then he started to bring in other nations against them to, to do oppression, to oppress them and to harass yeah. his own people. And, and the people's response was like, they weren't humble about it. They didn't say, oh yeah. You know, like, no, Lord. I, I, I relent. I come back. I get away from this thing that God wanted me to to not be a part of it anymore. He, and this is what the response was. And they said, you know, they said, that is, that is hopeless. So we will walk according to our own plans. And we will, everyone, obey the dictates of his own evil heart. That's what the response was. And it was like sobering, and you're hearing, you're hearing this, wow, this is, this thing is, this really is not the way. And, and God said to Jeremiah, for I know the plans that I have for you, plans of, to prosper you. That, you know, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, uh, not to do evil, but to give you a future, to give you hope. See, it's his thoughts that are inside of the potter that comes in, and he's forming us and fashioning us. He has a plan for us. And don't discount whatever it is you're dealing with this evening. No matter how big that thing looks to you, let God deal with it. Just give it to Him tonight. When we do the altar call up here, just identify with the fact that, yeah, no matter how big that thing looks to you, it could be a giant. But, you know, God's Word says that I'm going to take that giant and cut its head off. That I want you to understand and trust me with this thing and know that He's going to do it for His glory. And that's the thing, is that that's what happens is that he gets glorified. He's the one that will get the glory, not, not us. But it says here that when man lead the snow water in verse 14 of Lebanon, which comes from the rock of the field, will the cold flowing waters be forsaken for strange waters? Because my people have forgotten me. They have burned incense to worthless idols. So, so that's what we have to understand is that when we go to the potter's house, you see the person who hung on the tree for us. And we understand that he gives us the principle now that God is in control. He is the boss. Just let him take control. Let him do it. Let him just take that thing and let it come to pass what he wants, what his will is. And that purpose is whatever is in his heart and intention for you. And that's our prayer is, Lord, can you just... Reveal your heart and your plan for me. Yes. Just let me let me enter into that thing and, and just you do what you're going to do in my life. And let me get out of the way. Let me just step off and you take control Amen. in my life. Yes. But that is the, the thing that we have to understand is that, that he is the finder. He comes in and he forms us. And he is the framer. And, and he comes in. You ever see a building? You ever walk into a building and first they lay a foundation. And that foundation, Jesus says, the Apostle Paul said, there's no other foundation that can be laid than that which is Jesus Christ. Yeah. And then they start building the frame. 
and they start framing the, the skeleton of that building. And that's one of the most important things, other than the foundation. If the frame goes up wrong, then that thing could be leaning over. And then they start adding to the frame. So God wants to frame your life. Well, how did he do that? Well, when we look at the Passover, we understand that, that Jesus, he it was, you know, the, 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 he was our sacrificial lamb. In the Old Testament, in Exodus chapter 12, we see the, the door and we see the lintel and the doorpost. And so the, you have this door frame. And what did they do before they left Egypt? That, that, that was the death of the firstborn. And they took the, the blood of the lamb, they put it on the, on the doorposts, and they put it on the lentil. So they had to, that they were redeemed by the blood of the lamb. And so they began to walk out of that framework of the door. And what were they saying is that this is a picture that now God is going to frame your life. And you're getting ready to walk into the wilderness. It's a wild place. This is a crazy place. There's scorpions. There's, there's water you're going to need to pray for. There's all these different things. But God's word to you is saying that he wants to frame you. And so he's forming me as a potter. And he's framing my life. And, he, and we just yield. And God gives us the very thing that we need. The gift of faith to trust him for that. But then he's also the forger. Not a forger. I know I got a lot of forgers in this room. No, a forger. I forge some stuff. We all forge things. No, a for a, he's the he's the forger. So what does he do? He first he he finds the broken piece, he adds a little bit of water to it, it turns into clay, he's forming it on the wheel, he's in charge of the velocity of the wheel, he's in charge of the vocation that you're in. And I guarantee if you're an insurance agent, there might have been some sleepless nights you had. If you're driving a truck, you might have did something and you're, you've had some. There's some things that God enters into in our vocation. And so when he's forming and fashioning us on that wheel, all the circumstances of life, and all of a sudden, what begins to happen? See, there's, a, there's an intention. It's like a painter. It's an artisan. You, you, you don't give... If, if you just show someone a blank canvas, they're going to like, and you go, man, I got this picture I want to show you, but it's a blank canvas. They're going to look at you and go, uh, dude, it's blank. There's nothing on there. There's no, there's no work. But once the artist finishes the work, that picture, it speaks. That's, your, that's you. That's me. It speaks. That's, it's a picture of God's grace. And that's where God's glory begins to shine through us. And, it's, it, and he, especially, it, no, matter, it, 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 no matter who we are in that, in that field of blood, that he picks us out of, like the worse we are, the more his grace shines. It doesn't matter like what, the, what it is we went through. And then we see that picture, but then on the potter's wheel, that, that thing that's just a hump of clay, just a big, shapeless, formless thing begins to take shape. Yes. And then it becomes, oh, wow, I can see that. That's cool. And, and who gets the glory? The potter. Yes. The creator. Yes. God gets all the glory, man. Amen. That's why, that's why he, he, when that happens to us, what's the next thing that, it, that he does? Well, he, he shapes that, that pot. He takes it. And then he forges it in the fire. Yeah. It goes in the furnace. Now, I'm just here to tell you, and I'm just telling you as a witness, that unless God does the forming, and God does the framing, right. the, they don't going to stand in the fire. Yeah. Do you understand? Yes, but this is his work. So he takes and he places this pot and he puts it inside the fire and he forges it in the fire because it has to be filled. It's got to be filled. And it has to be for a little life of dependence upon the Holy Ghost. How many days did you and I go and go on and go on and go on? And we're not, and only the Holy Spirit, He could just tell us right now, am I, just, am I neglecting the Holy Spirit? And it, I, I can't do this thing. You started this thing. Yes. Yeah. But it says here that this is the finished work. He's going to finish it. Yeah. He's going to bring it home. Yeah. 
that not only is he going to finish it, but he's going to fill you with his purpose and with his, his, his spirit. Yeah. And, and that's what happens is, is that he comes in and he, he shows us that this is now something that is useful. That you're useful yes. to the kingdom Amen. of God now because you're perf in his purpose and in his plan. Yeah. So he takes us from a shard being found in the field of love. Just broken, formless, shapeless lives. And he finishes his work. And that's what's happening. Yeah. And it just... You know, where are we at in the process tonight? Yes. Are you are you are you in a place where you've you have no hope? You have nothing to look back to, you have no purpose or sense of direction. And God comes in, he's gotta find he, he's reclaiming you. And he claims us and he pulls us up out of that field of blood. I want to. I want to just. I got a few minutes, and I and I want to hand this back over, Pastor, to Pastor Walton, uh, uh, or to uh, my brother. Um, but I want to. I want to just. I want to say this. I want to say this, and I want to finish it right because that's what. This is what discipleship looks like. It's tough. It's tough. It's even tougher. Sometimes it's easy to sing things. It's harder to preach it. And it's easier to preach it than it is to live it. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> but God, is, we are living this thing out. You're in the potter's house tonight. And he's forming your life. Because he's got an intention in the mind and in his heart of what your life is supposed to be. And at the end of this thing, it's going to be after it comes out of that fire. I mean, how many here could say that, man, I'm in that fire. He found me. Amen. He's formed me. Amen. He's framing me. Amen. Amen. But he's forging me in the fire right now. Yeah. And he's, it's, it's creating like a spiritual, tenacious, like not hardness in the bad way, but strength. Yes. He's strengthening you Amen. so that when he fills you, that nothing is spilled. You know, and that's that's that creative theology that God wants us to bring out to a hurting, dying, lost world. Yeah. You know, yeah. let's give God praise in this place. Right here. 
unless you go through the fire, right? And unless you let him mold you, unless you let him build you, unless you submit and you say, look, I'm there. I'm broken. I need you, Lord. I need you today. So here's what I want to do. I want to ask you to come up here. Let these men pray for you. Okay? They're going to pray for you. They're going to pray that if you're there, and we're all broken pieces, they're going to pray for you right now that God continues to mold you, to shape you into that peace that just went to the fire and is sturdy and is ready to continue this ministry that God's called you to do also. So come on up here and get some prayer. I know there's some of you guys that in here that came in today asking for prayers. Now is the time. Come on up here. Don't be bashful. This is the perfect time for you to get prayer. And you guys in the back, I know some of you guys back there came in here with thoughts in your mind about is this real? This is not. This is the time to do it. This is the time to come up here, grab some prayer. Let the Holy Spirit guide you. Let the Holy Spirit give these men wisdom to pray for your.